And um, this event tonight is the final shine of a, a very nice lady who's here beside me, uh, Neve Hassett. And I just want to thank Neve for the work that she's done to put this event uh, together, uh, to remember those two occasions uh, during the time of the Civil War. Now, I suppose in recent years, we've had, um, we've, we've had I suppose, many events to commemorate uh, the War of Independence and, and the Civil War. And now we're on to, I suppose, the Civil War. And um, both COVID, I suppose, upset some of the, the events associated with the War of Independence and, and that, and, you know, we were confined to barracks to a certain extent. But I suppose if you go back 100 years, people were confined to there are places as well, from one reason or another, like, you know, to curfews and different things like that. But uh, the one thing I suppose we would have seen about those commemoration events is that there have been great turnouts at those events. So that sends out a message that, um, you know, people are interested, they're interested in our history, they're interested in hearing, like, what happened um, all those years ago. And while a lot of the events of those times are documented, in, in papers and in books and that sort of thing. There's, there's an oral history attached to them as well that like, wouldn't be written down. And that's something that we don't want to lose, really. And we have many people here tonight who are connected um, to the people that were involved. And, um, you know, when, when, when we, I suppose, when our, our day is, is done, really, if we don't reveal those that knowledge that we have will, it will be lost. So tonight's event, I suppose, is very much kind of part of that. And we'll be going through the, the events associated with, um, with, with Redmondstown and with Woodruff. Now, there were, um, I suppose, very serious events in, in ambushes and that sort of thing. And the one um, in Redmondstown, while it had a local significance, they, it had a national one as well. And we'll go through that um, as, we, as we go along. Now, Neve, Neve asked me to say a few words about my, my own father's involvement and maybe his family and his background because he was involved in both those, both those ambushes and had been involved in the War of Independence and in the Civil War. And I suppose like many of the people here, we would have picked up a bit of information along the way. My father didn't talk a lot about that. But you'll find that, that, that the women, I suppose, in their lives, might, you might get more information from them. So I would have learned a little bit more from my, from my mother and my aunts um, about the, the, those, those events that happened that time. But my father was, was, um, was born in Balmacarboy, so we have Deisha, Deisha blood in our, in our veins. He was born in 1894. Um, he, he, the, both husband and wife were, were, were of the same name, of Nugent. And Nugent was a common name on the Van McCarvey area for some reason around that time. There's still uh, quite a few of the families there. And uh, there, there was a place, I don't know, any you know it, the halfway barriers as you head out towards Dun Dunungavon Road there. There was local strode There was a, a little village up above there where uh, all the families were nearly Nugent. So that's where we kind of came out of. But um, my father's last known residence in Balmacarby is still there, and it's in a lovely little place called the Lawns, the many you know it. The Lawns is just near enough to um, near enough to Balmacarby village, and amazingly enough, there's a Dutchman living in the house at the moment. <laughs> He's living there for the last few years. So there was five children in the family. There was there was there was Jim, there was Morris, there was John, there was Ellen, and there was Mary. And unfortunately, I suppose, the times that were in it, um, people, you know, there was nothing found them really, there was no employment and that sort of thing. So unfortunately, people joined the army uh, in the First World War. So my three uncles uh, joined the army. And it's a huge coincidence that uh, my uncle John's anniversary is today, 104 years uh, since he died from, from wounds received in the in the First World War. So he died in France, and he's buried in France. My brother Seamus is here tonight. He went to see the graves. Uh, I didn't go yet, but I, I must go at, so, at some stage. So my brother John died, he died there, he's buried there. And my uncle Morris uh, was, was killed as well in France. Um, he was 21 
John was only 18. So my father was in that war as well, and of course that's where he became proficient with the machine gun, and he was known as the gun on urgent. And um, like, you know, like many of those people at that time, Jacqueline as well, he was in the First World War, and there was many more, and they, they, they became fairly proficient in, in the use of guns, and, um, and they became familiar with, with, with warfare, of course. So they were a big asset when they came back and joined the, the, the Taunterbury Brigade and, um, you know, with their familiarity from, with, with, with the ammunition, they were able to help the other uh, Conways and that. Um, and, you know, I think, in a way, there's probably huge credit to be given to a lot of the other volunteers who fought in all those battles because they didn't have any experience. They didn't have the knowledge of, of um, weapons and weaponry and that sort of thing that those who fought in the First World War were. So they put their lives on the line and were probably in a much more dangerous position than those people who had, who had the experience. So I suppose that was the early part of, of my father's life. He came back and he took part in the War of Independence and he was involved with the 5th Battalion in a lot of those skirmishes that took place around Tipperary. And you know, there was a huge lot of events around Tipperary. And um, you know, if you look into, I suppose, Dublin Castle and the archives there, they would describe Tipperary as probably one of the most lawless areas uh, in, in the county. And as a consequence, there was a, a high level of RIC uh, deployed to, to the Tiberi area to keep the inhabitants, uh, to, keep, to keep them down as best they could, I suppose. And that was difficult. But I suppose eventually it came to a stage like where the RIC were nearly confined to their barracks because they couldn't cope with the activities of, of the the Taunterbury Brigade, like in Tipperary. So that was um, the, the scene, I suppose, of the early days of, of my father. And um, he took the anti-treaty side then, after the treaty and that, and he was offered a captaincy in uh, the Free State, uh, with the Free State Army, but he didn't take it. And he, 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 he uh, stuck to his guns, I suppose. <laughs> he, he stayed with his, with his comrades. Uh, of that time. So I suppose my mother's, mother's people then and were, were from um, uh, Ballyvaughan in Pearlstown, which is very near, only a hundred yards or so up the road from where the Redmondstown ambush took place. So there was a, a very Republican house. Um, uh, my grandfather was the principal in the school in Pearlstown and uh, my grandmother was, was a teacher there also. They met in the school there and obviously became an item and they married. They had seven, seven children, um, maybe one more, maybe that, that passed away at a, at, a, at a young age. But they had seven children and um, like, we would have, I suppose we would have got a, a lot of the stories of the activities that went on there because the members of the column stayed in that house. It was, it was known, I suppose, as a safe house, but I got from the stories I heard, it was anything but safe because they were raided constantly. And, you know, my mother, you say the things, tell us about the things that happened, like, um, in, the, in the tan time, and in the Civil War as well, one more as bad as the other. Um, the, the tea caddy would be thrown out on the floor, and the sugar, and the milk would be spilled around the place, and all that sort of thing, and the, the kitchen would be kind of, kind of wrecked, like, before they'd leave. So they, they were the kind of reprises that they suffered, as in many other households around the country and around Tipperary found their involvement uh, in, 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 in the fight for freedom. And um, my, my grandfather was at one stage was, was arrested and he was brought to Waterford Jail. And if he was convicted of having a gun in his possession, or on the premises, like he probably would have lost his job. But what happened was on a Sunday morning, um, when the parents were gone, they went to first mass and the children went to second mass with the older ones brought in second mass. Um, the, there was a couple of RIC arrived to the house, be the way looking for the parents. They knew they were going to mass, of course. And they went out the back up to one of the fields, and they obviously hid a gun, buried a gun. So later on in the afternoon, when a big tourage of black and tans arrived, and they started digging out, the, out in the back garden somewhere, like an you know, old. And of course, they found that gun light, and of course, he was sold off and brought to the to, to jail in Waterford. But um, he was brought to court, but he was exonerated anyway, I think. 
whoever the judge was or the jury, they saw it through, I suppose, probably what was left on happening. But that's just a little, uh, a little uh, um, bit of information about the kind of things that happened during those days and the kind of things that people suffered for their involvement in, um, with, with the Republican movement and that. But that, that brings me on, I suppose, to the, to the Redmondstone ambush. And the story, the story about that, of course, is that in August um, 1922, um, there was a huge lot of activity around South Prairie in that the IRA had possession of the barracks in the early parts of, of August 22, and the, the Free Staters were approaching under General Prout. And uh, they, after a bit of a battle along the way, they were held at bay for quite a while, but they eventually succeeded in Paul Town, they took over the barracks. Now around that time, Eamon de Valera was in Clan Med, and intelligence reached the IRA at that time that um, Colonel Frank Thornton was coming to Clan Mail with a party of, of Free State soldiers, and their intention was that they were going to eliminate him and Devil Ayer. That was the intelligence that they had. Now, whether that's true or not, it will never be known, because after the events that happened, um, the Free State people said that he was being sent to have peace talks with him and Devil Ayer. Now, my own feeling about it is, if that was the case that we was coming for peace talks, there probably wouldn't have been an ambush. But with the intelligence that they had, it was very good. And it could have only come from one source. And that source had to be someone in the, in the, in the Free State area. Uh, so you really don't know, I suppose, now what kind of power play was at place during those times. There was obviously some bit of power play going on in, in, the, in the Free State Army and in the political situation there at that time. But the IRA knew that he was coming. They knew the day he was coming, and they knew the route that he was coming on. Now, he could have come in to Clan Mail by several routes. He could have come in by over by down, up by Carrick and down Lair. He could have come in the main road, although they tended to stay away from that to a certain extent. He could have come in by Kilmore and out to Monroe and in, in that road. But he didn't. He came along with, say, the foothills of Slevin Amman and came in by, if anyone knows it, he came in by Cold Moor, which would bring him down to Ballyvaughan and towards Redmondstone, where the, where the ambush uh, eventually uh, took place. Now, details of that ambush are well documented uh, by Egon O'Reilly, who was a young lad who was sent from Dublin at that time. He was a UCD student. He documented it. But the various things that happened, he documented in the Tiberi Journal and also in uh, Unshin McEwan's, I think to survivors leave, he gave a good account of it, like in, in, in that. And he described the day before, or the night before, that, that ambush. And um, well, it was all serious stuff. Um, it was the number two column that were involved in this ambush. And they had, after the barracks in Clonmel was taken over by the, by the Free Staters, uh, they went back to what they had been doing before, guerrilla warfare, I suppose, and um, they were um, <coughs> launching attacks anywhere they could where they thought it was appropriate, and that. So the, the day and the night before, they were billeted in an area around Down Lair. Now, for those maybe who don't know where Down Lair is, if you know where Two Mile Bridge is, it's just two miles out of the road on the road to Waterford. It would be across the river there, over, over on the Waterford side, and there was several houses in the Down Lair area, which were very strong Republican um, places and safe houses in that where um, where the boys could, could be put up from the day or on the night or whatever. And it was a fairly wooded area as well, so I suppose there was plenty of kind of cover over there. But that evening, there was a dance on in, the, in some local house, like, and now you think lads were preparing for an ambush, like, a serious ambush, where well, they expected two lorry loads of, of free staters to come, which was going to be a big battle. Um, but they, they went to the dance anyway, went off to the dance, and uh, Aegon O'Reilly was probably, was probably too young to go to a dance, like, so he stayed back in the house, and he describes it, like, you know, that night, and uh, he, he went to bed, but he couldn't stay in bed because there was things 
back those years that would be jumping around in the bed, like, you know. And, and uh, he, he was forced to get up. And of course, the people in the house were wondering, like, why he went to bed and why he got up again, like. And of course, he couldn't say what the reason was. It would be, it would be pretty insulting, I suppose, to say it. But anyway, he got up again anyway. And eventually, later on in the night, the, the lads came back, like, from the dance. And they didn't go to bed. So they had no sleep. So they took off sometime. I suppose you call it maybe early. They took off sometime early, on the early in the morning. Poor Mole gone. Who was flattened like, and everywhere they stopped on the road, he, he nearly went to sleep like, you know. That's the way he described it. So they went along anyway, and eventually came to Redmondstone and uh, the point where the ambush was to take place. And where it took place was uh, just kind of on the borders, nearly nearly three three um, towns then: uh, Redmondstone, uh, Ballyvaughan, and and Ballinvor. And there's a railway bridge there at Ballyvaughan. And Dalton's house was, was my grandmother's and my mother's place, was just up the road a small bit. And um, they set up there uh, on the railway bridge, and there was a forge just up the road a little bit as well. And from where that forge was, there was a good view for straight ahead along that road. It was a fairly straight road, so they were able to see, they would see any of those lorries that, you know, would come along. They'd have a good view of them as they came along. Now they were surprised, um, really, because only one armoured car came. They were expecting then that there was probably two lorries coming on after them. So they fired on that car. And um, there was two, two of the Free State soldiers killed. Uh, Frank Thornton, our, our Lieutenant Colonel Frank Thornton, uh, was, was badly wounded. Now, just to say a little bit about Frank Thornton, I suppose, when we're at it. Uh, Frank Thornton, in, in a sense, probably was, was a great man, really. He had fought in 1916. He had been a close confid confidant of uh, Michael Collins and a great, and a great friend of his. Um, he, he took the treaty uh, side um, when, when, that day, when that day came, and um, he, he got the rank of, of, of Colonel, and he took over um, a place that they called Oriel House in Dublin. Now, Oriel House was notorious. It was a notorious place for uh, torture, uh, for terror, and for murder. So this was a man who was well capable of coming to do the mission that, that the IRA believed that he was coming to do. He was well capable of that. Um, so he, he was seriously wounded at, at Ballyvaughan. And um, he, they were, he was thrown out of the armoured car uh, into a ditch. And this is something now that's in the oral history, but you can take it that is accurate. Uh, one of the IRA put a gun to his head. He knew who he was, and he was going to shoot him. But um, one of the others, I won't say who it was, said, if you do that, you will be shot. So he took down the gun, and he didn't do it. But um, I do remember my mother and my father saying that, that he was badly wounded and um, they had to cut, uh, seek permission from him to cut off the belt of his pants to be able to give him first aid and um, to, to, to do that for him. Uh, he, he was shot in the hip and he was a lucky man to, to, to be alive. But my grandfather, who would have been just up the road, like, who probably knew about the ambush anyway, he came walking down along, like, you know, I suppose after he owned the gunfire on that. So they, they, Jacqueline gave him a note. Jacqueline was the commander. And Jacqueline gave him a note uh, to bring to the barracks in Clanmel to tell them what was after happening and to, to send out an ambulance. But uh, a priest came along the way, a father Warren. He was in Gammonsville later on and, you know, was a, was a nice man, a nice priest. But I think he was based in St. Peter and Paul's at the time. Now, he was no fan of the IRA, like, and uh, he got a little bit mixed up about who was after doing this ambush. And uh, he was praising the lads, like, first, like, the great job they were after doing. But when he found out that that wasn't so, like, he gave him a fair castigation. And uh, they told him, get onto your trap and get back into town or wherever you're going, or you'll suffer the same fate. So they put the horn on him anyway. 
and um, he had to he had to he had to go. So that's kind of that's the kind of the story of, story of that of that particular ambush. And you know, there's a number of aspects to it. Like really, if you recall, that this that happened on the 21st of August 1922, and the day after, Michael Collins was shot dead. Now you could have had a situation that if Eamon de Valera was in Clonmel and your man did get to him, that both Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins could have been shot dead on the same weekend. There, there was that possibility. But Eamon de Valera had moved from <coughs> Clonmel, maybe for fear of this um, maybe attack on him or that. We, we don't know and we'll never know, but he did move from Clonmel and he was, when Michael Collins was shot, he, he was in the, in, in, in the Cork area. So, as I said, we'll never know why Colonel Frank Tarleton came to Clanmel. Um, we can only speculate on, 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 that, on that event. But um, th that was, I suppose, the, the story of, the, um, of that um, particular ambush. But I suppose, just to, for a little bit, just to look at the aftermath of some of, some of these things, um, you know, when, when the, the truce came and the the they away, like put their put away put away their guns and that like um, there was an aftermath and there was reprisals and I'm sure that all over the country that a lot of people suffered reprisals and certainly my father did anyway he he suffered them because um, he was shot at at a number of, on a number of occasions when he was unarmed he would have been unarmed of course and all those would have been unarmed after after that time. And he was shot at. He was shot at in Clanmel, in O'Connell Street, and and wounded, and on other occasions as well. But as a consequence, there was a great man in Clanmel. There, you all probably some of you know where the main guard is. His name was John Coney. He was way older than any of the other um, members of the of, of the column and that. But he was probably a pretty wealthy man in that. He gave great assistance to the to the IRA in terms of um, looking after them in various ways in regards to getting ammunition and guns and that sort of thing and making sure that they were looked after and had food and all that sort of thing. But he, he was always concerned about the about the volunteers, about what was happening to him when when the civil war was over. And he was concerned that my father would be shot, that he would be murdered. So he made arrangements um, to have him brought to Waterford to get on the